Now, I want to go slowly through these next verses. Uh, chapter 7, verses 25 to 36. Uh, 11 verses. It continues the first section of this interaction between our Lord and the people in Jerusalem. You see? And it's loaded with beautiful, beautiful theology. You see? Um, He's been speaking. And he said, don't judge according to appearance, but judge justly. That's the way we ended last week. Now we start with verse 25, which is still taking place on this uh, first... No, it's taking place on the, on the middle of the feast. Huh? Um, some of the Jerusalemites were saying, is not this the one they want to kill? And look, he is speaking openly and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the leaders truly know that this is the Christ? Why is he be able to do all this? Thousands of people around. And he's teaching in the temple. And he's speaking openly. And nobody says a word, okay? Can it be that the leaders truly know that this is the Christ? Now we come to a famous and recurrent Joannine theme. But this one, we know where he is from. Whenever the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. That's a tradition. Though, there's another tradition, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. But nobody will know where he is from. Okay. So Jesus, and these are powerful, my friends. Jesus cried out. He didn't say, oh yes, you could, you know. He cried out. The whole temple esplanade could hear him. As he was teaching and saying, you both know me and where I am from. And I have not come of my own accord, but the one who sent me is true, whom you do not know. So you know me, and you know I'm from Nazareth. But where I'm really from, you don't know. You see? I have not come on my own accord. I came because I was sent. And the one who sent me, you don't know. Even though you call him your Lord and the God of your people, you don't know him. If you did, you see, uh, you'd, you'd, you'd realize who I am. I know him because I am from him and he sent me. Now, if we take this statement, you see, Jesus is sent by the Father. That means he is somewhere where in a sense the Father is not. It's not that the Father is not there. It's a question of perception. If we take this text which is talking about the physical presence of the incarnate word in the temple court and apply it to the teaching of the theologians uh, about whom we were speaking earlier. Uh, like Aquinas will say, how, there's a mission of the Son, there's a mission of the Holy Spirit that takes place within us. So what is ascending? Is being someplace in a new way with a relationship of origin back to the Father. So the Son is sent when he's perceived. Filius mititur quando percipitur. So if I am in prayer, or wherever I am, and I'm aware of the presence of the Lord, that is a mission of the Son to me. He's from the Father, and he's present to me. He's present in a new way because of the way I know him. And that ultimately becomes the gift of wisdom. And in the gift of wisdom, St. Augustine says, and is picked up by Aquinas, a word proceeds within the person because he dwells in us. And so it's a verbum, a prochated, said non verbum qualicum, where not just any word, it's a word, spirans amorum, it's a word breathing forth love breaking forth in love. What word breaks forth in love? The eternal word of God. Because the Spirit comes from the Father and from Him. So, this text has many levels of meaning. The meaning now, Jesus is sent. 
He has a relationship of origin from the Father. The Father is his origin from eternity. They're co-eternal, co-equal, but there is that relationship of origin. And he's present in a new way. Not so much perceived as in the gift of wisdom, as perceived in his humanity. He's right there. Now, if you really look closely at somebody with an open heart, you can usually get a pretty good idea of who they are. Suppose people did that with Jesus. They'd see the Father. Our Lord said so. The one who sees me sees the Father. If he really sees me, if he really sees where I come from. And you can do that with the eyes of faith. Therefore, that's what our Lord is saying. And they know it. You see, I have not come on my own accord, but the one who sent me is true, whom you do not know. And now he goes one more step. I know him because I am from him. That's origin. And he sent me. And that's new presence. I know him. They were so angry that he would say such a thing that they tried to lay hold of him but no one could put a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. There is an hour for this. When the time comes they will arrest him, they will torture him and they will kill him and he will die in an act of love. But this is not the hour. There is still time to... um, Take this feast of Sukkoth and use it to help people grasp the Father's plan. And that's what he's doing. You see? Now the text goes on. Many from the crowd believed in him and were saying, The Christ, when he comes, will he do greater signs than this one has done? Now that's a, you know, That's not very deep, but it's a beginning. That's why our Lord worked the signs. Those signs point. And so, you see, uh, the Christ, when he comes, will he do greater signs than this one has done? You see, they are, their hearts are open enough uh, to think, maybe this is the one. Because... As the blind man is going to say, look, no sinner ever opened the eyes of a blind man. Right? So he can't be an imposter. Look at the signs he's doing. There's plenty of room for an open heart to come to the right conclusion. You see? Now the Pharisees heard the crowd. The text is the same word that uh, uh, you have before. Uh, murmur. But it's better here to because it can be used this way as well. You see, the Pharisees heard the crowd debating these things about him. They overheard them. And the high priests and Pharisees sent temple police that they arrest him. So they came, the temple police. And Jesus said, For just a little while I am with you, and I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am going you cannot come. Do you see all this marvelous double level of speech? I'm going. I'm going because you're going to kill me. But I'm going because then even my humanity will be divinized. And it will be with me. You see, it is my humanity. And in my humanity, I will be with the Father for eternity. I am going to the one who sent me. And so, this mystery now of the passion is opening up at this feast of Sukkot, all having to do, so far, with just the feast itself, the light, the songs, the teaching in the temple. You see, the very next time we start to talk about, you know, like next week when we do this, we start with verse 37. For Jesus on the last and greatest day. This is all in the middle of the feast and then the last day. You will seek me and you will not find me. And where I am going, you cannot come. Then the Jews said to each other, 
Where is he going that we cannot find him? Not to the diaspora of the Greeks is he about to go and teach the Greeks. Where is he going to go? We can't follow him. There's absolutely no grasp of uh, any other meaning. They don't want one. And so we have only this uh, anomaly. Our Lord says this, and uh, the Jews said to each other, So where is he going to go? That we cannot find him. Not to the diaspora of the Greeks to go and teach. So what is this word which he said? You will seek me and you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Now he's talking about the total transformation of his humanity. He's going to be with the Father. Now we can follow him. And one day we will. And this text is written for us so that we will know where he has gone. And all this will be pointed out to us in what follows. But we have for now this uh, speech of Jesus in the middle day of the feast, standing there in the, in the temple courtyard, teaching and speaking to them. And what is he doing? He is fulfilling the feast of Sukkot. He is bringing it to a new level where the earthly feast of Sukkot will end. And it does. We don't have a feast of Sukkot in the Christian liturgy. We have a feast of Passover. We have a feast of Pentecost. We don't have a feast of Sukkot. We could, and there was one for a while, but um, it never lasted. It didn't seem... Because it's the way... Our Lord treated it was of, as of a prophecy which is fulfilled in heaven. Whereas the Pesach and the Pentecost are ongoing fulfillment now. Whereas Sukkoth, the light, the water, the total commemoration of everything God has done for his people, that's heaven. And so while the Eucharist and Pentecost both our anticipations of heaven, uh, they, those we can celebrate, but not so called. And so we have this prophecy. Uh, and so what's going to happen now, you see, is that we're going to uh, listen next time to this solemn pronouncement of Jesus as it continual rings to the centuries. Huh? If any man thirst, let him come to me. And let him believe in me. And let him drink, the one who believes in me, rather. Now he said this of the Spirit, which those who believed in him would receive, and the Spirit was not yet. And that's why, you see, Sukkot is commemorating the not yet Spirit. And that's why we don't have an ongoing Christian feast for it, as we do for the Pesach, Passover, and uh Pentecost, because these are ongoing. We celebrate those and they're present to us. This one, we celebrate it uh, in anticipation. This one is a mystery of heaven without an anticipated mystery on earth. And so, for the next time, we're going to pick this up again. I hope you can understand how important it is that we, be, we acquire, I don't know what to call it, a liturgical mentality. Because these ceremonies, as you heard St. Thomas say, brought the patriarchs in touch uh, with heaven. You know? Because ultimately they point to where we are. And somebody who embraces an image, unless it bring him to the point where it, it indicates, arrives there. So our fathers were there. And are there in a way still if they don't realize that they're walking in the sunlight and still carrying a candle. But we should love them and pray for them. They are still our forefathers. Amen.